Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Marie O'Neill. I'm a faculty member here at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. We're very excited to have as many people registered as we have, and there are approximately 300 registered and several folks on the phone. So the title of our webinar today is Per and Polyfluoroalkyl Substances, or PFAS, with a particular focus on the emergent environmental, epidemiologic, and public health implications of the PFAS contamination in Southwest Michigan. In a moment, I'll introduce our panelists, but before doing so, I want to acknowledge the Michigan Life Stage Environmental Exposures and Disease Center at the University of Michigan, funded by the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, for their support in organizing this webinar. Core to our mission as a center and consistent with our mission as a public university is the dissemination of scientific knowledge to communities throughout the state. Central to this mission is our commitment to communication of scientific information to inform our understanding of environmental and public health issues and to inform decision making at the local, state, regional, and national levels. Following remarks by our panelists, we'll, we will have time for those in the audience, both physically and those joining us online to submit questions. So in the room, we have three, three by five cards, and then those um, who are remotely joining us can submit using the chat function. We are recording today's webinar and we will be posting it online later. And a quick technical note for those who are joining us remotely, on the right-hand column of your screen is a link to click that says chat, the second icon down, and you can there submit a question for our panelists, or if you are having any difficulty hearing, um, we, we are attending the chat so we can respond to your concerns. With that, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists for the session. Our first speaker is Professor Rick Radisky, who is a professor yep. of water resources at Grand Valley State University. He is an environmental chemist and toxicologist who has been actively involved in speaking with community groups, decision makers, and the media about PFAS contamination in Southwest Michigan since it was identified in 2017. He will describe key events of the PFAS contamination there, focusing on what is currently known about its environmental scope and impacts and what is known and not known about population exposure. Second, we will hear from Professor Detlef <clears throat> Kanape, PhD, who is from North Carolina State University. And his research is on unregulated contaminants in drinking water. In 2016, his group identified high levels of a fluorochemical with the trade name GenX in the drinking water of communities in the Cape Fear River Basin of North Carolina. He will talk about his experience with GenX and other perfluoroalkyl ether acids. Um, and he'll talk about pathways by which PFAS can enter the environment, impacts on drinking water quality, and the effectiveness of home filters for PFAS removal. And our final panelist is Professor Rita Lott Caruso, who is a professor of toxicology and environmental health sciences here at University of Michigan. She's also the director of the MLEAD uh, Center, which is sponsoring today's seminar. She is a toxicologist whose research focuses on health effects of environmental exposure, and she speaks regularly with community groups about public health effects of groundwater yeah. contaminants. Yeah. And what she'll talk about is the current knowledge on public health impacts of PFAS. And with that, I welcome you again and turn it over to Professor Radisky to prepare for that. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. This is my uh, alma mater, so I always like to come back to uh, East Michigan, but I'm here to talk about West Michigan today and uh, potentially bring some uh, interest and some raise some concerns about the uh, PFAS contamination that's in our part of the state. Uh, first of all, PFAS is, as uh, was mentioned, uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So per means all the molecule is fluorinated. And then poly means there's a few other uh, carbons or a few other side molecules attached to it. 
There's uh, thousands of synthetic chemicals that come in this category. We've started to use them since 1940s. And the most significant uh, compounds are the uh, PFOA and PFOS. And these are the ones that we have in West Michigan. We have some of the other ones too, but our main pollution in West Michigan is uh, PFOA and PFOS. Um, wide range of industrial applications, um, including uh, Scotchgard, which is the leather protector that's been involved with, with uh, pollution in West Michigan. The uh, AFFF foams, uh, Gore-Tex, Teflon, Stain Master, the uh, metal platings, uh, compounds and, and food packaging, electronics, oil mining production. So covers a gamut of different sources. And it's found globally, even in remote places. It's transported in the air. And it's also found in the biota through bioaccumulation. So it's a uh, persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemical. In terms of uh, West Michigan, the first place to start is with the area geology. And that's what's defining the movement and migration of PFAS. And if you go back in geologic history, we're right at the intersection of the Lake Michigan and Saginaw lobes, the glacial lobes. So meltwater, alluvial sorting, um, those processes were going on uh, in steroids you know, back a long time ago. So thousands of years ago, we had this uh, glacial melting and all of the melt water as, it, as it glaciers melted, it, it focused the uh, sorting of uh, pebbles, sand, cobble, boulders, and things like that. So um, as they receded and advanced, melted, and you know, form back again, uh, there's quite a bit of geologic diversity that's imparted into our area. And we have uh, both outwash and channel deposits. You can see the different colors respond or correspond to different types of uh, either outwash or channel deposits and they're uh, defined as uh, horizontal bedded and cross bedded deposits. So it's horizontal direction plus cross bedding, uh, fine sand to coarse sand, pebbles, cobbles, and we have a large terrace valley train system, which means continuous layers of these uh, sediments. So um, I don't need to go into much more details to show that it's complex geology, very permeable soils because of the fine and the coarse sands, and very rapid transit times because of the uh, pebbles and the cobble and the gravels. So we have a very highly productive aquifer. A lot of people decided to locate here just because of the uh, access to high quality water, but it's a very vulnerable system in terms of contamination from the surface getting in and then traveling great distances. In terms of the uh, Rockford Tannery at uh, Wolverine Worldwide, it was uh, first uh, in operation in 1908 and it was demolished in 2011. So it was in operation from 1908 to 2010, covered about 15 acres. Uh, the Rogue River you can see here is a uh, national scenic river and a trout stream. So it's located on a very important uh, local resource and, and natural resource for the area. Um, it used uh, bark tanning at first and then switched to chromium tanning in the 1940s. And in 1958, they introduced hush puppies as their flagship uh, shoe that was waterproof with Scotchgard. So the first use of Scotchgard, PFOS, PFOA was in 1958. Uh, they built this wastewater system in 1968, and it uh, included uh, two clarifiers. And the uh, wastewater went to the city of Rockford and later to the city of Grand Rapids. So uh, we never had a, a real discharge that I could find into the uh, Rogue River. It was always moved further to the south, or further downstream. The city of Rockford had a drinking water intake downstream of the factory, but upstream of the wastewater discharge. So the city of Rockford had a, uh, um, a intake for their public water system from uh, 1925 to 1999. And in, in the year 2000, they uh, put in a series of wells uh, in a confined aquifer. And that was what was used to supply the city with drinking water. Um, 3M notified Wolverine Worldwide in 1999 that Scotchgard would be discontinued in 2002 uh, because of uh, environmental and health concerns. So uh, there was an actual meeting on site where they met with uh, Wolverine uh, staff and told them that they were going to uh, discontinue the chemical. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, the tanning process uh, generates lots of waste. And 
for every 1,000 kilograms of hides processed, you get 850 kilograms of solid waste. So the need to get rid of this waste uh, is uh, associated with, with the tanning operations. And ever since they opened up, they had to get rid of the solid waste in various places. As the tannery got larger, you can see it's a substantial facility. Um, they needed more and more land to dispose of their solid waste materials. Uh, just a shot of the, uh, the site area, and you can kind of see here's that the wastewater system, and, uh, and there's this, this bend in the, in the property. This is what it looks like now. And um, there was a series of wells put in along the Rogue River, and this is 15 years post Scotchgard usage. And we had 490 parts per trillion of PFAS, PFOA in the groundwater. And this is right near the site where they had the uh, Scotch Guard stored at one time. So the question is, is this uh, from historic spills or is there more Scotch Guard further up here or more PFAS, PFOA further up into where the plant area was, was located? Um, that all has to be determined by uh, studies. Uh, in terms of the concentrations in the river, uh, they did a sampling during a uh, major, after a major rain event, so it was uh, probably a diluted scenario, but it was 10 to 16 parts per trillion in the Rogue River. And the EPA standard is 70, but the, the one that's being suppressed is 12. So, um, you know, it's hard to say, but you have to remember that this is uh, 15 years after uh, any Scotch Guard, the last Scotch Guard was used on the site, so it's had a lot of time to uh, pass through the river. So you can assume that the levels in the river were higher uh, historically. Um, some of these uh, bars here don't show up very well, but uh, uh, the PFAS is associated with high levels of ammonia. So ammonia comes from the decaying hides and the, the process. This particular site has very low ammonia compared to the other ones, so it does appear to be more related to chemical spills, but uh, we'll have to prove that with, uh, with uh, hydrogeological studies. In terms of solid waste disposal areas, uh, House Street is the main one that was operated in uh, the 50s and 60s. We have a large groundwater plume. They've tested 550, or 656 wells. The highest well is 38,800 parts per trillion, um, and that's a residential drinking water well. Uh, 233 were positive detections, and 30 were greater than 70. Uh, there's an MDOT site right across from House Street, metals and VOCs, PFAS hasn't been checked in it, but uh, it's a uh, unauthorized uh, disposal site uh, that waste just appears to be randomly dumped. Uh, we have the Northeast Gravel Pit, uh, which is also Boulder Creek Golf Course. They covered the gravel pit up. It was supposed to be designated as a waste site, but for some reason they were allowed to build a golf course and homes around it. Um, it was permitted for electroplating, tanning, and other disposable activities in the 70s, and it may have a possible impact on the Plainfield Township well system. We'll see all this in a, in a map in a little bit. State disposal is a permitted site. It's a Superfund site. It received uh, Wolverine tannery wastes. And the PFAS was found in Plainfield Township's municipal well supply at about 600 to 800 parts per trillion. So this is one of the wells that Plainfield Township uses. That was shut down uh, fairly quickly after the detection was, uh, uh, was, was published. And this well field was operating since the 1980s. So the question is, what was the concentrations in Plainfield uh, Township's water historically? Uh, Pearson Landfill is uh, outside of Kent County, but they accepted waste. And we just found uh, recently PFAS in their uh, monitoring wells. Butterworth Landfill is a closed landfill site uh, in Grand Rapids. Uh, it received waste. The PFAS has never been measured in that area. And we've had numerous farmland application sites where the waste was sold or was, was essentially given away to uh, improve agricultural soils. It had a high lime content, high nitrogen content. And this particular spot, the woven jewel area, 58,930 parts per trillion. Um, that's the highest uh, residential water sample that I've ever seen. Um, and that's in a farmland area. Um, 190, there was 530 wells checked, 194 were, were positive, and 67 were greater than 70 parts per trillion. 
Um, North Kent Landfill has 41 wells tested, three positive. That's another disposal site. And there still may be other areas because they were uh, taking these materials to uh, other farm areas, and they were also uh, disposing them sometimes in gravel pits. Just wanted to show you what the House Street plume looks like. Here's the uh, House Street disposal site, and you can see this uh, area of purple colors. That's higher concentrations of PFAS. The yellow areas are detectable up to, uh, I think it's 10 to 70. And then the green areas are non-detects. And you can see that there's a predominant flow this way to the Rogue River, but there's also you know, strange patterns moving either way when you think about the area geology where you've got a river channel going this way, um, and then you also ha may have cross uh, deposition of gravels and things like that that could uh, move the PFAS um, outside of that plume area. So very, very complex. And this is all residential wells with varying depths. Uh, so we need to have monitoring wells put in that go the full distance of the aquifer to determine what's there. But uh, the very high levels were right in this spot. Uh, these were the ones that were you know, thousands of parts per trillion in this area. Um, this is a map of the entire Rockford plume area. This is the farmland disposal site, the one that had the 58,000 uh, parts per trillion. This is the House Street site. This is North Kent Landfill, Boulder Creek, the state disposal area, Plainfield Township. So you can see uh, the substantial size of it. It's over 50 uh, kilometers squared. There's about 40 uh, kilometers of the Rogue River. The Rogue River starts here, dumps into the Grand River, but then it snakes around this way. So uh, there's quite a distance where this groundwater may be venting into the Rogue River. Um, Plainfield Township serves 40,000 people. So their service area is actually off the map here. Um, and then we have uh, thousands of residential wells in the area too. So. Uh, there's quite a number of potential sources, a number of different exposure routes to drinking water, uh, historical drinking water, and then current drinking water. And uh, there's some very limited blood uh, data available in terms of some of the uh, um, people that have been exposed. And this is a, uh, a summary of uh, the U.S. population at two parts per billion or two micrograms per liter. Some of the uh, C8 study in the highest areas had 228 uh, micrograms per, uh, per liter. And then uh, we look at DuPont workers and 3M workers. We have a infant, one and a half years old in the Belmont area, 500 micrograms per liter in terms of uh, the blood uh, concentration. And he was drinking that water for about a year and a half, and he accumulated as much as uh, the DuPont workers, you know, working with that material in the factory over lifetime. And we also have a Belmont resident with 2,000 micrograms per liter. Um, and she has a greater concentration. She has the highest concentration well, and her blood is uh, 2,000, so it's greater than the 3M workers. So there's been considerable exposure uh, to people, and the blood testing, uh, in my opinion, needs to, you know, be done. In terms of the current status, the uh, MDEQ has a MPART website that has a House Street uh, Belmont uh, section, and for some reason they stopped updating it in January. So uh, they were posting all the hydrogeological data and things like that. Um, we're kind of desperate to get information, and we would appreciate seeing more updates. There was an epidemiological study proposed in 2017, and that's kind of went nowhere. Um, we have a real concern about the impact of the area groundwater with respect to future municipal supplies. The solution is to send municipal water from Plainfield Township, but with all those gravel seams and things like that, we may have water from the Boulder Creek site getting into the uh, cross on the other side of the river. So um, the levels of PFAS, PFOA range from five to 11 in the township water now. They are putting it in a carbon system, but you know, is it prudent to use contaminated groundwater or bring in Grand Rapids municipal water, which comes from Lake Michigan? That's a big decision that we have to make as a community. Uh, impacts to fisheries and the environment, the DEQ is doing a study, and we really need to have some kind of a public advisory council where uh, we can get information disseminated to the public. So that's the end of my presentation.
I will turn it over to Dutlip then. So. All right, good afternoon. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so after uh, this story about uh, Southwest Michigan, I want to take you to uh, Southeastern United States, to North Carolina. And I guess for those of you listening um, in different parts of the country, probably most of you in, in the Michigan uh, area, um, maybe the story will make you feel like you're not the only ones there and maybe the vice versa. I think some people from North Carolina are listening and I think it's good to know that there are other communities that are struggling with with this kind of water contamination. And I wonder whether there are ways to connect some of those communities and uh, join forces to um, you know, achieve more rapid uh, uh, results in terms of uh, improving drinking water quality and also thinking more carefully about the use and discharge of uh, unregulated contaminants into the environment. So anyhow, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how fluorochemicals get into our drinking water and a little bit on how we can get them out. And uh, I will also be using this uh, acronym PFAS, which was already introduced. It stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which is a class of chemicals that contains thousands of uh, individual compounds. And PFAS are released into the environment through the manufacture of the actual chemicals. Uh, and then these chemicals are used in a variety of production processes and then also as consumers, we are exposed to PFAS through the use of some of the products that contain PFAS. So things like uh, the manufacture of nonstick coatings like Teflon uh, requires the use of fluorochemicals and the production of Teflon uh, leads to emissions of fluorochemicals into the environment. Uh, there's less exposure to PFAS through the use of the actual Teflon pan, for example. Uh, also, a lot of uh, fluorochemicals are used to coat papers to make paper, water, and uh, oil repellent. And so uh, certain uh, food wrappers or French fry holders might contain uh, fluorochemicals. So the, the one poster child there is also the microwave popcorn bag. You know, you can get significant exposure uh, through those. Water repellent fabrics uh, often involve the use of fluorochemicals. And then, as you just heard, the use of uh, stain uh, repellents in the manufacture of, of shoes, for example, is uh, uh, involving the use of uh, Dutch guard, which is uh, a, a basically a material that uh, contains a lot of fluorochemicals. It used to be PFOS, and nowadays it's a shorter chain compound. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then uh, firefighting foams uh, are very effective in snuffing out especially fuel fires. These uh, fluorochemicals can spread on top of a hydrocarbon uh, fire and block uh, access to the oxygen from the atmosphere. And so it's very effective in snuffing out the fire. But uh, these fluorochemicals are also thermally very resistant, which is you know, a desirable property in firefighting foams. But there are now alternatives that are fluorine free. Uh, so we need to think about um, moving towards those. So in Michigan, these last two items are, are key in terms of uh, fluorochemical contamination of drinking water. Um, as you just heard from the Wolverine site with Scotchgard or uh, firefighting foams like Wordsmith uh, Air Force Base is an example here in Michigan. Whereas in North Carolina, the example that I will show you will actually be an example where the, ex the contamination of the drinking water is a result of um, a manufacturer that makes the raw ingredient, the actual fluorochemicals that are used then by others. Um, so, very briefly, uh, long chain chem chemicals like the C8 or PFOA have been used for decades. And uh, 
their primary use has been to make things like Gore-Tex and Teflon. Uh, they are what we call polymer processing aids. So they help you make uh, these uh, materials like Gore-Tex or Teflon. Uh, PFOS uh, has been used primarily as a firefighting foam. It's been stockpiled still by the military. So this, this firefighting foam is still mm -hmm. out there. Um, and it was uh, used in Scotch. But these yeah. long chain PFAS are what we call uh, persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals. And as a result, uh, these uh, chemicals are being phased out uh, in the US. They've been voluntarily phased out by industry. And so they are no longer produced here and are also um, no longer used, at least by major uh, industries. Um, they've been replaced then by shorter chain. When you look at, uh, for example, a Teflon pan in the store, it might have a sticker and has a PFOA with a red mark through it. So then maybe you feel better because you bought a, a pan that no longer uses PFOA, which is one of the PFAS that we know a little bit more about. What you probably don't know is that that Teflon pen very likely was made with Gen X, which is the replacement of PFOA. And it's still a, a perfluorinated chemical. And it basically now has just this ether oxygen group introduced into it. Um, and it's a little bit shorter. It has six carbons and oops. Um, six carbons. This has eight carbons. So the, the fewer carbons, the less bioaccumulative the compound is, the, sh the shorter the half life in the human body. Um, PFOA has a half life of about four years in the human body. We don't know yet what the half life of Gen X is in the human body. Um, similarly, PFOS uh, in 2003, 3M uh, switched uh, yeah, so PFOS to PFBS, so the carbon uh, compound to a carbon compound. The half life of PFOS in the human body is five years, and PFBS is in the order of four months. So how do these compounds get into our drinking water? You've already heard from Rick about uh, the, the Wolverine uh, site where waste disposal practices led to leaching of these coal chemicals into the subsurface and then into groundwater. And then this groundwater might get sucked into people's uh, drinking water wells. Um, also, this groundwater might move to the river, as Rick explained. And so sometimes we see uh, surface water contamination as a result of contaminated groundwater moving to the river. Um, also, um, besides waste disposal sites, we might uh, take sewage sludge and land apply it. So we have a case in North Carolina where uh, sewage sludge levels of floor chemicals is being land applied very close to a drinking water reservoir, and then we find PFAS in the surface water. And then, of course, firefighting training areas. You could imagine this is a, a pit where firefighting practices take place, and this firefighting foam might seep into the ground and then uh, contaminate the groundwater. So one of the lessons here is that the sources can be highly varied. So we need to understand uh, what practices, what materials contain for chemicals, and how do we manage these materials uh, so that uh, we prevent them from entering the environment or drinking water. Now, the other uh, type of contamination is associated with manufacturing plants. Uh, either the fluorochemical manufacturers themselves, like we have in North Carolina, or some factories that might be using fluorochemicals uh, to make certain products, like Teflon. Um, and in this case, uh, we have emissions often through the air, which is something that perhaps is not as widely known. Um, and once these fluorochemicals enter the air, then they're transported with the wind. Uh, and 
over time, they get deposited uh, either through dry deposition or through wet deposition, like rain, uh, back to the land surface, right? And so then once the fluorochemical sits right here at the land surface, uh, they can be taken up by plants, um, which includes food crops, and they can leach into the ground and uh, contaminate the groundwater. Some of that groundwater could then also contaminate the surface water. Um, and then also we have uh, wastewater that's generated by these facilities and that wastewater might pass through a wastewater treatment plant and then enter the river. So here's your little virtual trip to North Carolina. So we have uh, here the Cape Fear River Basin, which is uh, the largest watershed that's contained within the state of North Carolina. It's a drinking water source for one and a half million North Carolinians. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, two communities here. Uh, one is the private well community that lives in the vicinity of the fluorochemical manufacturer, which is located right in the middle reaches of this uh, basin. And um, this community is primarily impacted through the air emissions. Whereas the wastewater that got discharged by this uh, facility traveled about 90 miles downstream and uh, impacted uh, a variety of communities that uh, are located uh, near the mouth of the Cape Fear River. Uh, in between, there are a few communities, uh, but most of them take water uh, from the ground. So, so they were not impacted uh, by this facility. But what you can see is uh, the discharge can have far reaches, you know, in this case, uh, 90 miles downstream. So if we go to the private well community that you know, is basically surrounding the fluorochemical manufacturing site, which is right here, um, our DEQ and the company, Keymores, have uh, uh, sampled private wells. They've sampled now over 800 private wells. And um, here in color, you can see in red are the, the sites where the well um, contained Gen X levels um, in excess of our provisional health goal, which is 140 nanograms. Um, the maximum level in, in the wells was 4,000, so we're not quite up to 50 plus thousand. Uh, uh, but Gen X is also yeah, not the only right yeah. uh, yeah. to the best of our abilities right now. We think that Gen X is about 50% of the total, but we don't necessarily know exactly whether we fully captured all of the PFAS that are in those wells. Um, so about a quarter of the 800 wells uh, uh, exceed our current health goal. Uh, then another large number have detectable levels of Gen X and a green or few that don't have Gen X. And so what's interesting is, uh, you know, the, the a lot of the, the sampling has focused on this uh, southwest to northeast trajectory. That's the prevailing wind trajectory. Um, and um, that's basically the way this uh, Gen X is reaching uh, people's uh, wells is through air emissions and uh, deposition through rain. And to prove that this is actually happening, uh, our DEQ also collected rainwater samples. And you can see here that even uh, five miles away from the plant, uh, the rain contained 810 nanograms per liter Gen X. Um, in fact, when you sample underneath the tree canopy, the water below the tree canopy washes out what's accumulated on the leaves at levels above 4,000 uh, nanograms per liter. So that's also proves that dry deposition that then gets washed off uh, when there is a rain. So what? Uh, is being done. So, so the the community around this plant until uh, last year had no idea that there were fluorochemicals in their water. They all uh, popped up um, um, 
after about uh, summer of 2017. So almost a year ago, the first samples of, of the private well community were collected in September of 2017. So the manufacturer has agreed to um, provide activated carbon filters to those residences where the Gen X level exceeds 140 nanograms per liter, which is our health, provisional health advisory level. And right now, this is just in the pilot stage. Uh, one such test uh, was completed. Uh, the way this is set up is you get uh, two activated carbon filters. Each carbon filter contains 200 pounds of activated carbon. Um, and monitoring showed that uh, Gen X broke through the first filter after treating about 25,000 gallons of water. The data are a little bit noisy. There was one point data point where even after 12,000, there was a detectable level of Gen X and it kind of settled down again and it came back up. So right now, the, the number of replicates on this is one. Uh, right now, four more houses are, are being evaluated. So four more homes are, are currently being pilot tested. If this looks promising, uh, then uh, those homes uh, that uh, are willing to participate in this program uh, will get uh, these filters. Uh, these filters are large enough that in many cases a little shed needs to be set up uh, near the, the well and uh, that's where the carbon filters would go. Um, you know, 25,000 gallons, uh, if uh, you know, typical water use in the United States, you can roughly say 100 gallons per person per day. Um, maybe it's a little bit less. So if, if you have a three-person household, you know, maybe you're using close to 250 gallons of water a day. So maybe they would have to change out the filter every three months or so. Um, but that still remains to be seen. Uh, also, right now, the focus was only on Gen X, not on some of the other compounds that are in the water. Some of the other fluorochemicals are not as well absorbed as Gen X because they're shorter chain. And, and so some decision making and thinking has to go into uh, the, the other compounds besides Gen X. So there are also a lot of concerns about PFAS contamination of food in this community. Uh, because the soil is contaminated, the rainwater is contaminated, as I just showed you, and the groundwater for irrigation would be contaminated. And so people wonder about fruits, vegetable, milk, honey, eggs, fish, wild game for, from hunting, poultry, pork, beef, and probably that list could go on. Uh, one beekeeper checked the honey. They uh, found 2,000 nanograms per liter Gen X in honey. Um, and we're working right now with one of the local residents. So we have a fun little citizen science project going on um, where he is setting up uh, um, different plots of uh, uh, plants using uh, a control, basically purchased clean soil uh, that will be watered with either bottled water or actively carbon treated water. And then also the same with uh, uh, a set of experiments where the plants will get uh, irrigated with the contaminated groundwater. And then also a set of experiments where we'll use the contaminated uh, soil. And, and so we'll see how much uh, of the fluorochemicals are being taken up by the different uh, uh, plants that people are growing. Uh, there is also concern with animal feed. You know, this the grass or hay that's being grown there that gets fed uh, to uh, uh, livestock. So lots of unanswered questions. You know, we're really just beginning to scratch the surface. Uh, our lab is involved. The North Carolina Department of Agriculture will get involved. Our Department of Environmental Quality is involved. Department of Health and Human Services involved. And this this is keeping a lot of people very busy right now, trying to answer people's questions. You know, what actually is the exposure beyond just the water? Now, if you migrate uh, 90 miles downstream, 
Uh, you have the city of Wilmington and, and Brunswick County and Pender County. It's about a quarter million people living in that area uh, near the, the mouth of the Cape Fear River. And um, when you look at the city of Wilmington um, and they take water from the Cape Fear River and we analyzed it for PFAS, you know, the legacy PFAS is what everybody typically looks at. So that's your PFOA, PFOS, and some of the other shorter chain compounds, C6, C5, C4. Um, you see that you know the legacy compounds make up a good portion of the total PFAS, but then you know we found Gen X in the water, uh, and that dominated the PFAS signature. So between 2013 and 2015, EPA surveyed drinking waters nationwide, and only six fluorochemicals were monitored, and the level the the reporting limits were relatively high. So quite a few communities, when they looked at their UCMR3 data, they felt like, oh, PFAS is not really a problem for us. Um, well, you know, the UCMR did not include Gen X, and it also didn't include C5 and C4, which are dominating the signature of the legacy compounds. Now, What's perhaps even more disconcerting was that the finished water contained essentially the same level of PFAS. And this plant is a very advanced drinking water treatment plant. You know, they have ozonation, they have biofiltration using activated carbon, they uh, have uh, UV disinfection. So it's pretty much a state of the art drinking water treatment plant. And it did nothing to PFAS. So this is very frustrating for a drinking water provider. You know, you spend a lot of money on your infrastructure. You think you're really uh, going beyond what is uh, necessary, and still these compounds are slipping through. What was then perhaps even more worrisome was, um, you know, if you look at the Gen X, the red bar here. Uh, we found other fluorochemicals in the water for which we did not have analytical standards. And so we only reported the mass spectrometer response and we compared it to the mass spectrometer response for Gen X. So there are other compounds in this water that exceed the concentration of Gen X by a lot. And and so the total PFAS concentration in this water actually approaches what uh, you see at some of the most highly contaminated sites near the Wolverine plant. Um, we estimate somewhere around 40 to 50,000 PPT. These estimates uh, can be refined now. We just recently received analytical standards for these compounds, so we can start quantifying what the levels of these compounds are. But again, none of them were removed by the water treatment process. So we published this work in, in December of 2016 in the ST letters. Um, we tried to bring attention to our paper, um, but it took six months before it actually um, got communicated uh, widely to the public through a very well written uh, and well researched newspaper article. Um, and as a result uh, of this newspaper article, this is actually a follow up uh, a week later. Uh, as a result of this newspaper article, uh, the community got very upset about this contamination. You know, being kept in the dark and drinking stuff about which we know nothing in terms of the toxicity uh, doesn't sit well with the public. And so what was very powerful in the response was that the local officials and the public all were pulling on the same string, from the mayor to the county commissioners to the public. Everybody was upset about this. And they demanded to have a meeting with um, and have them explain what's going on. 
And this meeting was very instructive because um, when we initially try to understand the history of Gen X. Gen X was approved for commercial use in 2009 by EPA through Tosca. So we thought Gen X really wouldn't have been in the water until after 2009. But in this meeting, it came out that Gen X had been in the water since 1980 because Gen X was also produced as a byproduct at this manufacturing plant. And byproducts are actually excluded from the consent order that EPA issues when you are allowed to make a certain uh, compound for commercial purposes. So that's a very interesting story in and of itself. You know, this, this question of byproducts is completely unresolved uh, in terms of management. So to their credit, the manufacturer agreed to collect all the processed wastewater from their fluorochemical manufacturing plant. And as a result, very quickly, the Gen X and fluorochemical levels in the water supply dropped dramatically. Uh, but there, you know, even though this looks very tiny, the total is probably still close to a microgram per liter. Um, so, you know, this, the drinking water plant, uh, just issued a request for proposals to construct an, uh, an additional treatment process in their plan to help get rid of the remaining fluorochemicals that are in the water. This remaining fluorochemical level will probably stick around for a while because it's coming probably from runoff and contaminated groundwater that's leaching from the uh, manufacturing site. And that's my last slide here. So, you know, what can these uh, water treatment plants do? You know, the city of Wilmington chose to go with activated carbon. Uh, activated carbon is more effective for long chain compounds. So it's very, uh, and a very effective solution for a lot of the, the contaminated wells near the Wolverine site, for example. Uh, it's less effective for short chain compounds. Carbon works a lot better in groundwater than in surface water. So, you know, when people ask me, is activated carbon working well or not? It, it, the answer is really it depends on, on your situation. Uh, anion exchange has promise, uh, and then membrane treatment processes like nanofiltration and reverse osmosis. So the take home message is uh, PFAS manufacturing and use contaminates water, air and food. The impacts of that are adverse on public health and people's property values and also on agricultural product values. And we need a lot more educations. Consumers lack information on what is made with PFAS and what contains PFAS. You know, in the end, these compounds are made for a reason and that is that there is a market for them. And often we don't even know that we are the market and that we're buying this stuff. So I encourage also all of you to look at this website, uh, the six classes website. Uh, that helps uh, you understand a little bit more about the PFAS class and uh, where PFAS are used and in, in which types of products. So with that, uh, I think we can go to questions later. Uh, these are some pictures of my students and postdocs and you know this this problem is keeping us very busy these days great so hello everybody um, I'm Rita Locke Caruso and I am a toxicologist that and I have spent most of my career trying to understand how and why environmental contaminants cause adverse health effects I'm also the director of the MLEAD Center that is sponsoring this webinar. And as the director, I want to extend a special welcome to those in Grand Rapids who are listening to this webinar. Because it is the community concerns from Grand Rapids that provided the motivation and the impetus for our center, this NIEHS MLEAD Center, to become involved and organize this webinar to try to help you sort through some of the complexities of this PFAS contamination. 
So your community in Grand Rapids, as many communities across the world now we know, um, have found that there can be point sources of pollution from these PFAS contaminants. And these chemicals were sometimes welcomed into, oftentimes welcomed into the community by uh, wooing industries to communities that would provide jobs. But sometimes these industries close up, they move on, and the legacy chemicals remain. They remain in the groundwater, they remain in the soil with the opportunity to rise up out of the soil, rise up out of the groundwater, emerge into our consciousness with concerns about public health. Kind of, I've heard the metaphor, kind of like zombie chemicals. So um, I am gonna go back a little bit to deciphering this chemistry code because toxicology and environmental contamination can sometimes just sound like alphabet soup. And so you've already had the PFAS term defined for you, but what I wanna bring you to are these diagrams here that help to make the point that these PFAS chemicals are chemicals that have strings of carbon atoms joined together. And what makes them a PFAS is that at least one of these carbon atoms has at least has one, has a uh, fluorine atom. So at least one of the carbon atoms in this string has a fluorine attached. And you've already been introduced to the concept from the previous speakers that there are a lot of possibilities here that you can have different numbers of carbons in the string. The carbons can be linear as shown here, or the carbons can branch out. Sometimes you can introduce another molecule in the carbon string, like an oxygen that was shown for Gen X. And now you've got another chemical. Sometimes you add a whole branch of more carbons out. And because of this, there are over 3,000 of these PFA chemicals known in commercial use with at least 5,000 PFAS is known. And this causes a regulatory nightmare because all an industry has to do is change one atom in the molecule and we're back to, we're back to ground zero in terms of regulation. Um, the other point I wanna make is that uh, these two particular PFASs are shown because most health information that we have on PFAS is limited to these, these two molecules, the PFOA, or the perfluorooctanoic acid, and the PFOS, the perfluorooctane sulfonic acid. So in these cases, all the carbons have fluorine atoms attached to them. And down here at the end, we've got some additional atoms that make them acids. It's not mysterious chemistry. Um, the other thing I'd like to say, just to make a point, is that uh, the chemistry, the fluorocarbon, link is very stable. And that's one of the things that make these chemicals so magical. And I would say that as a consumer, as a citizen, when you hear a chemical described as a wonder chemical, your antenna ought to go up. We've had these before. We've had asbestos introduced as the amazing magical a uh, substance that was going to fireproof things and, and heat resistance, et cetera. We've had uh, the PCBs, the polychlorinated biphenyls introduced. They were heat stable and lubricating, and they were in transformers and capacitors. We've been here before. And these are chemicals that are very chemically stable. Uh, the, it varies depending on the particular chemistry of the chemical, just how stable it is. But um, when you hear that something is a wonder chemical, you should start asking questions. So what happens when you drink PFAS contaminated water? And I focus on water because I think that is a major concern for the community that initially came to us. First of all, when you ingest PFAS, whether it's through water or it's through food, you take it into your, your, your system. Most, if not all of those PFAS molecules are going to be absorbed in your gut. It's very well absorbed by your gut. Super great, gets into your bloodstream. Now what happens to it? Well, a lot of chemicals that we take into our body through our gut get metabolized. They first go to the liver and the liver is one big metabolic factory. But our livers can't do much with most of the PFAS chemicals. Some of them they can metabolize, but the two 
most common legacy PFASs, the PFOS and the PFOA, are not metabolized by humans. We can't change them. Uh, there are some of the other PFASs that can be metabolized, but sometimes that's not a good deal because some of those PFASs get metabolized to PFOA. So this is not necessarily helpful for our health. The other thing that happens is that PFASs stay in our bodies a long time. And this is not really true of all species. There's tremendous species differences in what happens to PFASs when it gets into a biological organism. In fact, that's one of the problems with toxicology. We don't have a good animal model. Why? For one thing, it just doesn't stick around in any of the animal models we've looked at to the extent it does in humans. Uh, Dr. Kanapa has already told you that for PFOA and PFOSs, the half-lives are around three to five years. That means it takes three to five years for one dose of these chemicals, for half of one dose of these chemicals to leave your body. Okay, there's still stuff left there for three to five years. And you're not just exposed once, you're, you're being exposed again and again and again. And because it's so slowly eliminated from your body, it's got the potential to build up in us. But you know what? In monkeys, that half-life is on the order of months. And in rodents, like rats and mice, it's days to weeks. So it's a real potential issue. The other thing is, so it sticks around in our bodies for years after we take it in, after we ingest it, and it gets stored. And it gets stored primarily in our blood, in our liver, and in our kidney. And another thing about these chemicals, they are not typical bioaccumulative chemicals. So this is a problem. So for example, in the EU, the, the European Union, where they look at and apply something called a bioaccumulative index for flagging chemicals of concern, these PFASs don't follow the rules because they are not fat loving. And that is different. Most chemicals that are bioaccumulative, that build up in our bodies, and that biomagnify through the food chain from the little fish eating the big fish and the eagles eating the big fish, et cetera, et cetera, um, those biomagnifying chemicals are usually fat loving. They're fat soluble and they get stored in fat and they stay in your body because of that. But these chemicals don't like fat and they don't like water. And it's that chemistry that makes them a wonder chemical that makes them so great as treatments for our shoes, for our rugs, for our chairs that we're sitting on, you know, for all of those things. So, uh, they, but they do stay in our body. So if they're not fat, fat loving, what are they doing? They're binding to proteins. These chemicals are going to be a real toxicological challenge for us to find out. What about other exposures? Well, I didn't even think about food. I was thinking about the classics. I was thinking about um, air you breathe, and I wasn't thinking that it was um, emitted so much from um, chemical plants. Yeah, um, and I would say that a major, uh, aside from living downwind from a plant that uses these chemicals, a concern if, it, if it's in your public water supply, a concern can be taking long steamy showers. So some PFASs will volatilize. They will go into a vapor phase and you can breathe them in as a vapor. But in a hot steamy shower, any PFAS can become aerosolized. It can go into water droplets that are now suspended in the air and you breathe them in that way. So um, the classic legacy PFAS is PFOA, PFOS. These are not likely to volatilize, but they certainly can be breathed in in a shower as aerosols. And once you take into your lungs, um, whether as a vapor or whether as an aerosol, um, it will be absorbed into the body. It's been harder for us to get a good handle on the absorption from the lungs. Uh, it looks like it's the best estimate we got was about 10%, but I'm not really horribly sure on that. But certainly less than GI tract, but still significant, less than the gut, the gastrointestinal tract. The absorption is possible also, but it's much, much less than if it's ingested or inhaled. So who's most vulnerable? Well, from animal and human studies, the most vulnerable 
are pregnant women, the unborn fetus, and the newborn infant. And I think we can add the child, the young child to that as well. Some of the outcomes of concern that have been linked to PFAS exposure are low birth weight, preterm birth, pregnancy-induced hypertension, that's where the blood pressure goes up, it's also called preeclampsia during pregnancy, uh, delayed puberty onset in the offspring, especially mammary glands have been uh, demonstrated in uh, animal experiments, um, some uh, behavioral issues like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And the one that's generated the greatest concern uh, recently, I think, is this immune response suppression in children. So children who have been exposed to PFAS, particularly we're talking about PFOS and PFOA, while uh, in the womb or in early infancy, uh, primarily through breastfeeding, although it can also be through formula from made with contaminated water. But these children have a weakened immune system in how they respond to um, a challenge. And so in terms of life, that means that they get sick more often. They uh, have colds more often. When they get sick, they get sicker. But what's recently been shown in a study that was recently published is that children who had nanogram per mil concentrations of PFOA, PFOS in their blood had significant depression of their ability to form antibodies after getting vaccine shots. This is a classic immunosuppressive response. So the ability to form antibodies it's really important for our survival. That's how come we don't get sick every time we meet a germ. Once we've seen the germ, we're supposed to have antibodies to it, and that's how immune systems work. So, okay, I'm, I'm gotten the two minute sign. I just wanna tell you a little bit about cancer risk and then how it's regulated. So the International Agency for Re Research on Cancer, which is a World Health Organization agency, classifies PFOAs as possibly carcinogenic to humans. And they, um, this is based on limited evidence in humans. It can cause testicular kidney cancer, limited evidence in animals. It's uh, primary, primary concern is that things are not consistent across studies. And the EPA Scientific Advisory Board has a draft report for PFOA in which they failed to come to a conclusion about carcinogenicity, uh, concluding that there's suggestive evidence of carcinogenicity, but not sufficient to assess human carcinogenic potential. There are some other reported health risks to adults, including difficulty becoming pregnant, uh, liver disease, kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, immune response, like we talked about, osteoarthritis. But I think something of particular help for our community residents is understanding how drinking water contaminants are regulated. So the federal drinking water contamination, and I, I, I put deliberately the capital up here because it's legislators who make the law it's regulators who have the responsibility of enforcing the law. So the Safe Drinking Water Act is the federal law that empowers the US EPA to set standards for drinking water, but only in public drinking water supplies. The US EPA does not have authority to regulate private residential wells. It does not have the authority to even recommend criteria or individual wells. And in addition, the EPA only regulates, and I meant to count it because unfortunately I couldn't find the number, I just found the list. I, but there aren't that many of the thousands of chemicals that contaminate drinking water. I don't know, one to 200 or have standards. Do you know how many? A hundred, yeah have standards set for them. Those are the only regulated drinking water contaminants. PFAS, they are not regulated by the US EPA. There is not a drinking water standard. However, they're identified as priority contaminant of concern. And then there is the other law, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA, which is commonly known as Superfund. 
But PFASs, including PFOA and PFOS, they're not listed as surplus Superfund hazardous substances. So what can the EPA do and does do is that it can issue a drinking water health advisory for water contaminants that are not regulated. And uh, Dr. Kanapa referred to these as the unregulated uh, uh, contaminants and that six PFASs have been monitored and aren't monitored now, I don't believe, on the last one. They're no longer monitored as unregulated contaminants. Um, but anyway, they, they, EPA has issued a drinking water health advisory. Um, it's uh, estimates of margin protection for lifetime exposure from drinking water. It's important to know that a US EPA health advisory is not enforceable under federal law. It's not regulatory, it's not statutory. And, uh, but for PFOS and PFOA, there is a US EPA health advisory. It's 70 parts per trillion, which is the same as 70 nanograms of PFAS per liter of water. And the state of Michigan adopted the US EPA health advisory level and uh, 70 parts per trillion. And this was estimated based on fetuses during pregnancy and breastfed infants as the most sensitive population. Final thing I want to say is that those estimates for the 70 parts per trillion level is based on population risk and you should not confuse population risk with individual risk. Individual differences matter and they impact on your or your individual risk. For example, risk is very strongly modified by biology. I already mentioned species differences. Age is important. We've already talked about that. Uh, what about the elderly? We don't know hardly anything about that. Uh, sex, there are sex differences in responses to PFASs. Uh, exposure about health status. Are you healthy? Do you have cirrhosis? Do you drink alcohol? Do you smoke cigarettes? Do you eat a healthy diet? Do you exercise regularly? Are you pregnant? You know, Are you tall? Are you fat? Um, all these things can impact on a particular person's individual risk. And as Dr. Kanapi mentioned, for these thousands of PFASs, the individual chemistry matters. So the bottom line, PFASs carry health concerns. We don't know nearly enough, but we do know enough that we should be paying attention. So thank you. Um, coverage of uh, varying perspectives or, or varying um, pieces of information related to the PFAS. I want to invite all of the panelists to come up here to the front of the room. We have time now for questions and answers. Um, I have a few questions that have been sent in by members of the web audience. For those of you in the room, if you have a question, Look for one of the three by five cards and write it down. And I think Sharon or Todd will be circulating around the room and picking those up and bringing them up to me. Um, and I will read the questions and invite one of our panelists to answer them. So I'm going to start us off um, by one of the uh, questions that came in um, uh, over the, the webinar link. And um, this is, I think, set up for you probably, although others feel free to chime in. Um, the question is, how much do the whole house filters typically cost? The charcoal filters, I assume that you're talking about. And the second part of this question is, are they housed in sheds because they need to be near the wellhead? So the, the whole house filters that are provided for the private well community in North Carolina would be paid for by Kim Morris, actually. Um, when you look at whole house filters uh, on the market, the prices can vary dramatically uh, from maybe $1,500 to many thousands of dollars. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, questionable vendors out there also. So I, I really urge everyone to be careful in terms of choosing what to purchase. Also, when you are on a public uh, water supply, 
um, especially a surface water supply, I don't recommend whole house filters because they dechlorinate the water and then you have basically water without a disinfectant running through the pipes in your home and then there, the risk of opportunistic pathogens and colonizing the pipes will go up. So, so there are lots of tricky questions when it comes to choosing what kind of filter to install at your home. Um, so there, there was one other follow-up there. Oh, oh why, uh, why are they housed in sheds? Oh, why are they housed in sheds? I, I think the main reason is uh, uh, to prevent freezing. Um, and and basically, not everybody has enough space in their home for two such big filters. So it's to to minimize the inconvenience for the homeowners. Um, okay. So a second question is: Is there any way to determine the effect of drinking Rockford City water um, for at least ten years? prior to the new wells being put in in 2000. So I think the health piece of that question probably is to you, Rita and um, Brittany. Sounds like an epidemiologic study to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think there would be issues of, of estimating the exposure would be very critical um, and the size of the population. And I would, I would have to, as an experimental toxicologist, have a an epidemiologist weigh in, to be honest. Yeah, I would agree as far as uh, noticing it in your blood. Um, there's a sufficient number of half-lives where you wouldn't be able to probably detect a difference, but you would have to look at uh, incidences of certain diseases or uh, a general epidemiological study for that population. So that to Rita's point about we need to know much more about um, these chemicals and how they. Yes, and I think we would definitely need to get um, professionals engaged who are well, um, uh, have the expertise for doing the proper design because I don't think that the, the community needs a study that provides information that's useful. We don't want to just do something to look like we're doing something. Thanks. Um, another question, and I think this is related about the blood work for PFAS. Um, how does the blood work for PFAS compare to that of other chemical testing methods, um, including for the cost? Maybe a big question. We're. we're we're in the middle of uh, a health study right now for the community in Wilmington, North Carolina. And, and so we collected people's tap water and blood and urine. Um, the method for the analysis of the blood is not really more challenging than the method for water. In some ways, it's actually easier uh, because the concentrations in blood are higher. Um, but there are, of course, some requirements in terms of dealing with um, people's fluids, so biosafety requirements and things like that that we have to follow. Uh, there are commercial labs that, that will analyze for PFAS in blood. Um. Blood testing is the only way to really assess your exposure. And because of the long half-life, um, it does tell you roughly if you're exposed greater than the average person. Um, there's means for the population and you could easily look at uh, different cohorts of exposure like Plainfield Township water versus uh, the solid waste disposal areas and then look at what the uh, blood levels are to gauge exposure from those different types of uh, means. I think that's really instructive in terms of population level exposures. Is there a way for people to individual blood lead levels to, or not blood levels, but blood levels of PFAS to understand their, their individual risk? 
I, I think that person, you know, you're, what you're moving towards is something called personalized medicine or personalized public health. And um, I think that we're not, we're not there yet. And the best that can be done is a comparison to um, uh, some of the levels in the, you know, that are nationally known, average. et cetera, average. Um, I think that's an ideal and it's certainly a, uh, a goal for the NIH. Okay, I'm gonna continue on the blood theme for one more question. Um, this question is, if PFOS is in blood and someone donates their blood, mm -hmm. can it be harmful to the recipient? Um, it'd be a one, it would be a one dose. Um, so I would say that the risk in terms of um, versus an exposure of living in a contaminated area or being exposed to con you know, contaminated drinking water or contaminated air because of a proximity to a contaminated site would be much less. All right. Of course, it depends on how much it is. Exactly I know. I mean, I, 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 I'm just thinking to some of the doses I saw on Rick's slide, you know, some of those are pretty hefty. And how much would you get? Yeah. Um, Okay, so of the unpublished ASTOR's recommendations to lower the safe limits to 12 parts per million just came out in the. What was the first part of that? Can you? What is your opinion oh. of the unpublished uh, recommendations? Actually, I did a deep dive into that yesterday morning when I hit my email. Um, I strongly suspect, but it, I, I you know, of course we haven't seen, what, what this is about is that there's a press, uh, it hit the, the press, the news, that the ATSDR, which is an agency in the Centers for Disease Control, um, it prepared a draft document and sent it up the ladder and out to other agencies like Health and Human Services and the EPA uh, in which they were um, evidently, the, the news report is that they are saying that the current health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion is insufficiently protective of human health and that it should be approximately one sixth of that, which would be, I think, 11.67 parts per trillion. Um, so uh, there was, I, I dug around and read a couple of articles and I just came up with a few words that gave me, I think, a little bit of insight on it. And, um, uh, but it's unclear. You're sort of trying to read the tea leaves and of course we haven't read the report. I think it's, it's referring to that developmental immunotoxicology study, personally. I suspect that that's a strong driver. And the reason I suspect is because in that article, there was an allusion to, uh, it alluded to um, uh, the, the former health advisory was based on, uh, you know, fetus in the womb and breastfed infants. And this one's based on immunotox. But I haven't seen any immunosuppression study that was more, how should I say, um, that, that showed an effect at such a low level beyond this one. There was a study done with um, uh, children in the Faroe Islands cohort. Um, Dr. Brajean, um, the first author, I think. Of course, one of part of the challenges, this report has not been released, so we don't the know. The report's not been released, but this right. immunosuppressing mm -hmm. study is in fact released. Uh, uh, published. Yeah, it's published. And also the state of New Jersey um, uh, has proposed maximum contaminant levels, actual standards um, for PFOA and the perfluoronanoic acid. They're looking at PFOS right now also. And uh, for PFOS, they came in at 14 nanograms per liter, so very similar to 12. So there's, you know, I think, evidence accumulating that a, a lower level is, is justified for, for drinking water. That actually mm. it touches on another one of the questions. And the question is, do you know the science that is behind that? And I just. I not fully up on okay. all of the different <laughs> health studies, Emma, 
I'm an environmental engineer. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, so Gloria posts and, and the Jersey is really very much an expert on all of the different health studies, especially for the legacy compounds they've looked at. And there are a variety of different endpoints that they've considered. It's not just immune. There's, there's also uh, uh, liver toxicity involved, and I think something. Quickly look at it. No, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, <clears throat> the the data of the toxicological data that's um, out there is definitely pointing more toward uh, individual sensitive populations being of concern. And I think some of the uh, drivers for maybe lowering it were, as uh, was mentioned before, that uh, it, the, the fetus, the child, um, uh, that's a, a very sensitive part. And the, with the uh, immunosuppression, um, there's all sorts of uh, toxicological endpoints that we're learning more about. So I think it's just, uh, accumulating knowledge and accumulating information, people are looking at that and, and drawing different conclusions. And just quickly, I'd like to point out that the so the health advisory, the US EPA health advisory comes out and it publishes a, um, a maximum con contaminant level, which is a recommended level that includes things like economic concerns cost and uh, cleanup feasibility and technological feasibility, but they also have in their tables for those contaminants, those unregulated contaminants, a goal, an MCLG, a maximum contaminant level goal, and that is the level below which they expect to see no adverse health effects. And for, PFO and P, for PFOA and PFOS, that is zero. All right, we have a lot of questions. I think we're not going to get through them all, so um, our best to get to as many as we can. Um, one question has to do with if local municipalities are trying to use filters to um, get PFAS be below the standard level, what are residents supposed to do with the new information about the 12 parts per, per trillion? So I guess the the question for the for the drinking water providers would then be at what level what level do they consider acceptable? You know, so the the 70 nanogram per liter level, for example, that is the current health advisory level of the EPA, um, is a guidance value, but once communities install treatment to control PFOA and PFOS level in the drinking water, often the the goal set by the utility is well below 70. Um, I, I know that there are a number of utilities around the country that are installing treatment, even though the levels are maybe just in the 30 or 40 part per trillion range. Um, so, where where all of this is going is you know the drinking water community sees this as a um, a need to control to manage risk from a risk perception perspective and the the demand from a lot of residents in their uh, communities is to basically have that goal of of non detect and. And so I see a lot of utilities moving towards that. Um, so it depends a little bit on the philosophy of, of the treatment plant. And often um, the cost of treating to non-detect versus treating to um, 70, let's say that cost difference isn't really all that big. Um, I think with, especially with uh, the situation in, in Rockford and Plainfield Township, um, you know, the, the wells themselves do have the, the township, uh, Plainfield Township water does have some uh, PFAS and PFOA in it. And I, I think if you're in the 
sensitive populations, um, you know, and you you feel the need. I think having a, a carbon filter is 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 totally appropriate. The bigger question, though, is do we want to take water that's contaminated and uh, filter it and treat it, or do we want to use a source that doesn't have that contamination? So I think as a whole West Michigan community, we have to ask those kinds of questions of ourselves. Right. Um, this is another question about how individuals can reduce their personal exposure, I think, as we're thinking about ways to reduce around the drinking water uh, levels specifically. And this one is thinking about spikes in surface water following extreme precipitation. Might individuals uh, who switch to bottled water for the period right after a heavy rain, might that lower their levels of exposure? Well, the... Um... In the Rockford area, we have groundwater, and that's actually diluted by surface water. So it's not a traditional uh, compound that would run off. I think it's more appropriate for uh, the Cape Fear River, that, that kind of question, so. Yeah, I, I think it would be sort of tweaking at the edges, I would say, if you wanted, to, if I understand the question right, if you time your use of bottled water or link it to precipitation events, for example. You have a precipitation event, you have more runoff. That means maybe more fluorochemicals will run off from contaminated land into the river, but the river also flows at a much higher flow rate, so that can also lead to dilution. And to understand when the PFAS levels are actually the highest based on uh, weather, it's, it's very difficult to to actually gauge. You know, it's actually more likely that um, during low flow events you have uh, the highest uh, PFAS levels because there is less dilution and a larger percentage of the river might be flow from that contaminated groundwater that's uh, discharging into the river. Right. I'm going to let Rita have the last word. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just very quickly, it's not related to reducing your risk for exposure through water, but through other means. One of the great things you can do is vacuum. You know, vacuum your home, clean your home frequently because dust builds up. We know these things like the flame retardants and uh, P PFASs that shed off of your, your, your carpets, your clothing, et cetera, et cetera. So especially your bedroom because you spend a lot of time asleep in your bedroom. Thank you, Rita. I'm going to ask everybody to join me once again in thanking our panel for their time and their expertise. Thank you, everyone who joined us remotely. There were a number of questions who came in that, that came in that we did not get to. Um, those of you who signed up for the webinar received a link to a site where we have some additional information there about PFAS in general and also about the specific contamination in um, in Western Michigan. Um, we will take a look at the additional questions that we weren't able to get to and see if we can't pull together some responses to those and we will post them in that same place. You can go to there if your question didn't get addressed today. Thanks everyone and uh, thanks again to our panel. Thank you.